Hey y'all, Tom, ND3N here, and I've got a new hat. This time, we're going to be taking the ham clock in a new direction. Specifically, we're going out of this world Far out. and looking at an extraterrestrial exploration focusing on the sun and all things solar that the ham clock can display. We'll also take a short tour of extraterrestrial things closer to Earth. In this first segment, we're going to look at different images of the sun, the moon, and sunspots. As always, any questions, concerns, corrections, please, or general remarks can and should be left down in the comments section below. What are you trying to say? SDO is from the Solar Data Observatories. It is a physical count done off of multiple sensors and this is a composite view of all the sensors. And uh, let me go through the different sensors. Remember, Dick, don't look directly into the sun. This is the magnetogram. And this is the one that I like to use the most. It just shows the sun's face. And you can see some good sunspots here. This is another sensor, another way of looking at it. And another way. And one more way. And finally one more now i'm going to show you one last setting that you can do that here is the rotate and this cycles through all of the different pictures that the scientists look at to try to determine what's going on at the face of the sun now we got another thing down here we have the gray line tool i have my dx set down here on the isle of tasmania this is going to show the local and my DX location rise and set times so that you can tell when you can operate the gray line. Magic things happen during the gray line. So we'll just click on resume. And another thing that you can pop up here, you can ask it to show you a movie. And there's the magnetosphere. That happened to be the picture that was up at the same time. But you can watch as the sun rotates and see what's coming up on the horizon and stuff. Get out of that. Let's move over and take a look at the moon. And you can see right along the edge here, just the barest crescent. Not quite a full moon there, but it's going to happen here momentarily. Down here on the map, this is the moon. And you can see a little bit of white there. But if this was a half moon, this would be half white, half black. This is the sun. Now, another thing that the moon shows us, we have an EME tool. EME is Earth, Moon, Earth, or Moon Bounce. So you can see here where the lunar elevation at my DX location and my local location is pretty much following. And where you see the green bars down here on the bottom, those are the times that you can make an EME contact. And let's go take a look at sunspots. If we go back here and look at our picture of the sun, you see a lot of these are a lot darker than others. Some that are just a tiny little speck. And those are one or two sunspots that are located. This is a group of sunspots, a group of sunspots, and here's a large group of sunspots. Now we've got scientists who are constantly watching the sun. We're online like scientists. And determining the number of sunspots. And they use the different sensors to look at the different numbers of sunspots. About once every four hours, they get together and they begin to haggle and they come to a consensus to, of what the sunspot number is. It gives you a good instinct. Now, you can also see the sunspot number. If we bring up our VOA CAP here, the sunspot number is right down here in the corner. So S equals 196. Also, you can bring it up here. If I turn on space weather, turn off my local weather, here's our sunspot number right here. We also have the solar flux index along with our X-ray and solar winds. And we can see a historical study of the sunspots by clicking in the sunspots. 
This brings up the history of the sunspots, starting in 1900 and coming right up here to this is the latest one. So you can see the 11 year cycle that you've heard about. This link will take you to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, N-O-A-A, website, where all the terms mentioned throughout this video are discussed in greater detail. This link is also in the video description. I'll leave that deep dive to you and just review the high points as the video progresses. If you're enjoying this video, please take a moment to pop that thumbs up icon and give me a like. I like where the sunspot numbers were observed and interpreted, the solar flux shows solar activity by sampling energy levels at the 10.7 centimeter wavelength. Now it does closely track the sunspot numbers and if I click up here, you'll see the history. This one starts about 1948 and you can see it's doing the same 11 year cycle. So that's how it's related to the sunspots. And this shows the magnetic field. The strength of the interplanetary magnetic field is given a value called BT and that is this red number here. It's measured in nanoteslas. The north-south direction of the interplanetary magnetic field is labeled BZ and that plays an important role in the formation of the northern lights. DRAP is the D region absorption prediction. Now I'm going to change my map down here. We have a DRAP map. So you can see where the maximum absorption is by this color. It is caused in the sunlit area. So this is our sunlit area. And if you look down here, there's a little red bar. That happens to be right at 13.7 megahertz. I'm going to put our map back to terrain and I want to bring up one more thing. We'll just replace our DRAP with our NOAA space weather. No weather in space, right? This gives us three readings. The R is radial blackout impacts. Right now we have none. All of these are uh, on a scale of zero to five with zero being no effect, one being minor and five being extreme. And if we were to have a massive solar flare with a CME or coronal mass ejection that's throwing stuff at us through space and it hits the earth, then these numbers would rapidly change. The S is for solar radiation storm impacts and G is a geomagnetic storm impact. And you'll see these numbers changed when there is massive energy from the sun beyond what's coming off of the sunspots and the solar flux. We're almost to the end. Just a few more panes with obscure solar data to present. A reminder that the NOAA website has deep dives for any and all of these. As is my habit, the links are in the video description. The video description also has chapters listed where you can quickly jump to, to review or review any portion of the video that catches your attention or needs to be watched a second time. If you've learned something new while watching and if you have friends who might also be interested in this content, please share. You shall! <laughs> with those friends and compatriots in the ham radio community, especially on any social media sites you may frequent. KP is an excellent indicator of disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field and is used to decide whether geomagnetic alerts and warnings that we saw back there in the space weather chart need to be issued for users who are affected by these disturbances. GPS signals can be affected, satellite communications can be affected, and yes, ham radio operators can be affected by these disturbances. And my personal favorite, X-ray specs. X-ray tracks solar activity and solar flares as measured once per minute on the GOES satellite. Large solar X-ray flares can change the Earth's ionosphere which blocks high-frequency radio transmission on the sunlit side of the Earth. 
Solar flares are also associated with coronal mass ejections, which can ultimately lead to geomagnetic storm. The blue track measures x-rays in the short wavelength of 0.05 to 0.4 nanometers. The red track shows longer wavelength of 0.1 to 0.8 nanometers. Solar wind shows a graph of measured solar winds over the last 24 hours with an indication of the latest measurement. Now one more extraterrestrial thing that helps with their communications. If you come over here and you click DX, it brings up all the local satellites. I'm going to pick the SO121 and click on it and say, OK. And now you can see the track that is happening. It's actually coming down. This satellite is coming down over Greenland. It's going to follow this track and completing out. It'll repeat that track right here. So right now, SO121 is rising in a little over five minutes. It's currently located over Greenland and it's coming down and this is the track and it's going to come up here, go off, pick up again here and come down and hit us again in about another 90 minutes. If you need to know more, you can go to the www.amsat.org and on that page, you can go look up SO121. It'll tell you what frequencies it uses. It'll tell you when it was launched, what modes. Now, another one that we can do is I'm going to say change my satellite. And if you like working the ISS, that's right here. So let me bring that one up. And here's where the ISS is. The next rise is going to be in 37 minutes and 55 seconds. It's currently here around Australia. And when it comes up, it's going to pass down the East Coast and out. The next rise will be a little bit more. So it progressively move west. So next time it might come down closer. But depending on where you're located, that's when the ISS will be available. Again, go to the AMSAT page, look at ISS. Uh, they have a lot of good things. They actually have FT8 working off of the ISS. So you can make a quick contact uh, FT8 with the ISS if you're lucky. The AMSAT website contains a plethora of information about all the amateur satellites available including modes and frequencies and critical information about each satellite that will help you make contacts. I hope you've enjoyed and learned from this video as much as I've enjoyed and learned while putting it all together for you. 73 until the next Hey Y'all! This has been a Hamshack chat about extraterrestrial explorations enhanced by the fantastic Innovato Quadra Ham Clock. Please remember to like, share and comment and also please consider subscribing to this channel. I certainly appreciate it. I'm Tom, ND3N, and I am out. It was very educational. <laughs>